And Bean, you're the one that suggested that business skills were something that artists needed. What particular business and other kinds of skills do you think that an artist needs to be successful? Well, you know, first of all, if you're going to go into this as a, you know, as a full-time artist or to make a living, uh, you need it, you, you know, you need an accountant, <laughs> yeah. you know, you have to be, you have to make sure that you uh, get with your accountant because uh, you're, you're responsible for your, for taxes. So you have quarterlies to pay. And so if you don't make those quarterlies uh, on time, then there's, there's uh, penalties plus interest attached to that. So, uh, and then you have to keep track of everything. And that includes your miles in your truck, whatever you use for business, uh, you, know, you know, naturally your art supplies and things like that, travel. Uh, there's so many things that go into this. Plus, if you're like, like me, being self-employed, um, I, I fund my own retirement accounts and, and different things like that. And, and I handle a lot of my own investments and stuff like that. So those are things that are real important as you are trying to get established as an artist, because, you know, for me, I've always wanted to be able to paint what I wanted to paint as opposed to painting for a market, which is a whole different kind of sensibility. Uh, where if you're, if you're making money, while you're making money, make sure you invest it, make sure you save, because there will be times where you will not be able to sell something. And so you want to be able to have something to cushion you until the following month or maybe even the next two or three months. So all those things matter uh, if you're, if, if you're you know, wanting to do this as, as, as a full-time professional. Those things really matter. What other kinds of things you might need to, to know, though, business skills? For example, marketing, uh, other kinds of things that you say they just don't teach you in art school. Well, yeah, there's a lot of things they don't teach you in terms of, of how to go about finding a gallery uh, or even when to approach a gallery. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of layers to it in terms of, you know, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, in the old days they used to have – where you could send in slides or, or, or transparencies for, for, an, for a, a gallery to, to, to consider your work. Uh, I've been fortunate in, in the fact that, you know, a lot of galleries approach me. Um, but initially, as when I was in college, I had a gallery when I was in college because I needed, I needed to make money because I was poor. I didn't have the resources. So I was able to, you know, enter local shows that got me in front of uh, the public. And then by entering those particular shows, it got me in front of people who took, up, took interest in me and took me around and tried to find me a gallery. That was my first experience with a gallery. I was probably still a teenager selling my work for like $25, $30. Uh, but that also helped me go through school. And I got a lot of experience from that. People look at me and they see the success, but there has been layers and layers of years of my life developing this. This is not something that I decided to pick up, you know, you know, once I retired or something like that, this has been something that I have pursued all my life. So it's, it's a, it's, it's different when you are, you go to school for it. And then when you get out, you know, if you, you don't get hired, like I got hired as an illustrator for Hallmark cards initially. And so that was, that was, you know, uh, more of an, in the illustration area because in college they told you it was very difficult to be a fine artist. It's just very hard to make a living mm -hmm. in selling your own. And so I got a job at Hallmark Cards as an illustrator. That did not last. And so I, I got let go. And so there I was on my own with very little money with nobody from my family who could really, really help me financially. So I had to really figure out, you know, how I was going to really uh, support myself with my work. And so um, the galleries, of course, were the, was the first thing that came to mind. But again, if you don't have very much experience, you realize that with a gallery, first of all, when I first got out here, they were taking, I think, 30%. And then when I was in Kansas City, they were 40. Now they're 50%. So you can imagine you got to give the gallery 50% of, of, your, of your labor on top of the, the cost of framing. And so uh, there's a, like I said, there's a lot of layers to understanding how this business really operates. Yes. And some of them are taking more than 50% now. 
some of them in New York and different places like that are even taking a higher percentage. But I do realize when you are known, you do have some leverage. Um, and so uh, getting known and also, you know, the fact that there's also the, the website now and different things, artists can, you know, there's a way to level the playing field. There's other areas of, of things that you can do. Like I self-published my first book. That uh, was a tremendous amount of revenue for me, but it was also the fact that I didn't even realize how known I was until I did the book and so many people were ordering it. And so I made a huge profit from that book and, that, and I published a second book. And so at a time when I couldn't get a publisher interested because they were afraid to take the risk on, a, on an artist of color, uh, an artist that they felt was maybe perhaps not you know, known enough to be able to sell a book. So I took the risk. I reaped all the benefits. Of course, now I have publishers wanting to do a book. But at this stage of my life, I'm established financially. I don't need a publisher to do my book. I can do my own books. And so you begin to control some of the financial uh, economic uh, um, revenue streams uh, through your own uh, initiative and through your own endeavors. So I've never sat around and, and waited for anybody to give me anything. I've always been willing to work and, and, and figure out a way to, to, to generate income and so I could uh, can stay free as an artist to, to paint what I wanted to paint as a painter and not what other people just wanted me to paint. So the timid artist is always going to be the hungry artist, right? Yeah, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. I mean. Yeah. You know. What, you, you talked about some social media tools. What, you know, website and so on, what social media tools do you think an artist needs to be using today? Well, I have, I have to be honest with you. My wife is really, is really the social, the, 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 you know, the, the internet person. I mean, I was a little skeptical about the whole internet thing, but, but what I've realized that, uh, you know, with, with the different shows, uh, we also do a, what we call a newsletter monthly. We'll do newsletter and, and letting people know, collectors know that I'm an artist who is continuously active. Because people who, you know, when, when they spend a certain amount of money on your work, people want to, to keep in touch with the artist to see what the artist is doing and what shows they're involved in. And because that keeps the, that keeps the collector engaged in a lot of ways. And so that's a form of marketing. So when you do do a show, uh, collectors, you know, nine times out of ten, they're usually going to respond. They're going to come out. And so, and, and in that way, you also, uh, again, you generate interest in your work and, and different things. I've done, you know, prints and posters and different things like that for people who cannot afford my original works. And by having those avenues to the internet, I have been able to sell posters and prints internationally as well as my books. And, in, and on occasions, uh, a painting. So uh, the internet can be, be really a tool for reaching uh, outside of the, the normal uh, local, what we call local community. Uh, so I think that's a way you, you, you throw a wide net. And so you're, 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 you're bound to uh, get people, more people interested in what you're doing. So your wife kind of is a primary support for you yeah. a lot, just like a framer might be maybe. Yeah, She does the Twitter. She does the newsletter. I'm not savvy with a computer like that, nor, nor do I have the, the time. My time is just strictly painting. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm almost doing too much now since the pandemic. I've had so many different things pulling on me, trying to help different organizations with, with things like this, that uh, it, it's, it, and I got a family, you know, I have yeah. a, two young kids, so, but, you know, they need my attention and my wife wants my attention. So, so it, you know, so there is a, there's a constant balance, balancing uh, thing here. Uh, when I was single, I could stay, I could work until three or four o'clock in the morning, sleep at 11 o'clock, you know, during the mid, middle of the day. Uh, but I have a family now, so it's a, it's a whole different, different ball game. So when I tell people, look, I, I can't do certain things. It's not that I don't want to do them. It's just that I, there's only so much I can do. And I got exhibitions, I got museum things that are two years out, you know, out in the, in the works. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of things I'm juggling. Uh, uh, with, with success comes what comes a lot of, a lot of juggling too, you know, it's a lot of juggling going on. With and that. it seems the more successful you are, the more demands there are on the non-painting part of your time. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. And you have to be careful. Uh, like I have people, you know, I've, you know, I've had uh, recently, 
you know, tons of people, you know, asking me to do a workshop, you know, I really don't, you know, I don't have time to do a workshop, nor do I have the interest. I did them early on in my career. Uh, but right now, all I want to do is concentrate on my own work and, and that kind of thing. And so it just, it takes away from, you know, my creative process if I'm involved with a museum and then I'm running back trying to figure out, you know, it says you, you got to pick and choose your battles. I did that battle early on in my career. And now uh, my battle now is to, is, is to create quality work, hopefully, and, and, and you know, keep, keep my family supported and, and also, you know, enjoy the, enjoy the, uh, the process and the moment. Uh, so that's kind of well, working right now. So what's the division of time that you would like to spend between painting and the rest of your life? Oh, <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I, I mean, I got kids. Uh, so, but the, the irony, the irony of this is that I went to college and uh, although I went to college, there wasn't a lot of, you know, instructors showing you how to paint or anything like that. I had great drawing classes. I mean, the professors sat there and he demonstrated and did things like that. But in painting, you know, I rarely did a professor show you anything about mixing color and the, the chroma level of, of your, your, your palette in terms of, if, you know, if you mix too much of this or that, it kills the chroma level and, and makes things muddy. All these things I had to learn on my own by going to the museum, by reading books, by experimenting. I'm really a self-taught artist in terms of painting. I did have a watercolor teacher who, who, uh, who did do demonstrations on occasion, but his paintings were, 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 were very commercial in a lot of ways. And so, so the, the nuances that I wanted, I had to, I had to really look and, and really just try over and over myself and, and basically self-taught. And so the times when I have given workshops, it's kind of hard for people to follow me because I don't really have a system. Uh, I really don't have a system at all in terms of my painting. It's all intuitive. You know, you know, whatever blue I'm using, I may be able to tell you, I may not be able to tell you, I may tell you it's a dab it, it's a dab it, you know, it's all about a feeling and, and, and I go with whatever works. Uh, it's, 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 I don't, I don't have, a, I have a process. So, so uh, it, it's just, um, it, it's just, you know, it's, it's just difficult sometimes to, to, to uh, sometimes even with painting, I'm going now, I'm working more in oils now. I kind of got away from it. I was doing mostly watercolors. It's a little bit difficult now because, I mean, acrylics, I'm, I'm fine with it, but with oils, there's a lot of reflecting going on with the light. Mm -hmm. It has to be done properly and all that kind of stuff. So, so I'm constantly pushing the envelope and trying to, trying to grow as a painter too. That's the other part of it. And so sometimes it does get a little, little, a little hard with trying to figure out um, balancing the family life and the professional commitments as well as my own artistic growth as, a, as an artist. So it, it, it can be you have 10 year old twins, right? Yeah, it, it could be boys, boys or girls, boy and a girl. And they're both, ah. they're both creative. So that also helps too. the fact that they're creative. Uh, and as they get a little older, uh, they'll be able to hang out in the studio more with me. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm working in toxic materials, so I don't want them around when I'm working in oils because I put on a mask and I wear rubber gloves. And so, but when I'm working in watercolors or acrylics, they're welcome to come over and do things themselves with me. So, so that's well, how much time would you like to spend during a day working on your own work? Oh, or developing your skills? Uh, anywhere from eight to ten hours. Um, solid working. I work on, uh, I don't know whether I have some kind of attention deficit disorder, but I can't work on one thing. It drives me up the wall. I have to work on 10, 15 things uh, during the course of a day. I'm kind of all over the place. Uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes when something's not working, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll start working on this watercolor. Or I'll start working on an acrylic. I start off working on a watercolor, then I work on and then I jump around and I work on an oil painting. Uh, and then I start, I start out at an easel I'm at the easel, and next thing I know, I'm sitting on the floor, you know, because I, I'm, I still have a, I have a habit of when I was a kid, I didn't have materials, so I would just sit on the floor and lean the painting up against a, a chair or anything. I'm still doing the same thing. I can't break the habit. Just, <laughs> you must have an amazing number of different workstations scattered about the studio. Everywhere. <laughs> People, you know, people saw my studio, but I had it all cleaned up. And they said, well, your studio is really neat. They haven't seen it when I'm really working. It's just a mess. Stuff's everywhere. Okay. 
obviously somebody who wants to be an artist but that has a family and does all of the support work themselves is not going to be able to spend that amount of time without getting divorced. Yeah, that's um, true. See, I, you know, um, I was, I, I was married once. Uh, it didn't last. It lasted about six months. I was in my early, I was in my twenties. It didn't work out. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that and she already had children. And one of the things that I, that I, I, I got a really good lesson from that. Uh, and, and, uh, when, when that divorce was over within the last, within six months or so of the marriage, uh, I said, boy, I said, this is your dream. This is, this is, this is not your wife's dream or a girlfriend's dream. This is your dream. And so I decided that I would not get married until I was established enough as a man to be able to take her, provide for her family. Mm. So I'm a much older father. Uh, and so when I got married, there was no, it was not going to be any real issues about my ability to take care of my family. Uh, so that's been a big, big relief because I look at all this stuff with the, with the pandemic and the effect on the galleries and different things like that. But all those years that I was single, I didn't run around and buy a fancy car. I didn't run around and spend my money on fancy jewelry, you know, ridiculous kinds of stuff. Instead, I invested it. I saved, I did a lot of things. So by the time I was ready to get married, I was, I was established financially. So that makes a big difference when you have children and a wife. Now, that does not mean that I don't have to make money because we, we rolled through some money here at this house. So, so I still have to work, you know, but at the same time, uh, I realized that I'm a lot more secure than, than a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, I've been blessed, but I've also been very practical. I've always lived way below my means. Uh, and so that's always helped me. Uh, that's helped me to, to build a nice nest egg and a nice savings. I'm, I'm definitely a saver. I've been this way all my life as a child. Uh, watching my grandmother work for a little and her struggling probably taught me a, 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 a deep sensibility about money and not to waste it. Uh, and so I'm not a wasteful individual. And I think that's why I'm established now as a painter. Well, Aside from ethics, it's, it's also I, I have noticed if you grow up poor, you tend to become a saver. Yes. Same experience. Um, you mentioned two different people who are big support sources for you. Your wife, which do, who does a lot of the, the social media work, and you mentioned an accountant. Mm-hmm. Now, starting early on, you probably didn't have those, though you did mention sort of a, a, a good Samaritan who took you around to galleries. Yeah, that was... Uh, um I was in my, uh, I think I might have been my, I might have been a sophomore in college or just got out of my freshman year. I had entered a show in Panama City and won a prize. And a lady by the name of Joanne Dickerson uh, uh, took a liking to me. I went down to Panama City to, to get the, it was a $100 savings bond. I still remember, it was a $100 savings bond that one. And when I walked in the door, of course, they, they, they said something about my color. They said, oh, you're black. And, you know, and I said, yeah, you know, he said, well, you're the first black yeah, person here. <laughs> And so they said, you're the, no, you're the first black person to enter our show. And so a lady named Jordan Dixon, who I think she might have been one of the board members at the Panama Art Association or something, she took it upon herself uh, to uh, take me around. But before that, uh, after I won the award, I went back home and I was working at the local canning factory. And my uncle got a phone call from her that, uh, that I was going to be teaching some classes for $10 an hour painting classes. And so I told my uncle, I said, you must be out of your mind. Nobody's going to pay me that kind of money. That's a lot of money. Somebody's going to just watch me paint. You're going to pay me $10 an hour. That's a lot of money. He said, yeah, they're going to pay you $10. I said, Uncle Ben, you must have heard it wrong. And so she called back, and it was, you know, $10 an hour. And I went to Panama City and did the class, and she took me up and down the panhandle. And uh, a lot of them didn't, at the time, didn't want me in their gallery because I was a person of color. They were afraid they'd run off their clients and all this kind of foolishness. And so... There was a, uh, so my first show there was at a, at a bar. Uh, it was called a Safari Lounge. I still have the articles on these things. It was called the Safari, Safari Lounge. And so on Sunday, uh, we put up easels and people came in and bought my work out of a bar. And then Joanne said, well, I know a new gallery that just opened up on Beck Avenue. She said, well, why don't we try there? We went over and I met the gentleman. His name was Zotan. His wife's name was Vicky. Vicky was an artist. They took a liking to me. They thought I was very talented and they had my first show there. And in fact, without Zotan, I probably wouldn't have been able to get through college. He sold mm. my work when I was in college. He did shows for me during the summer. 
and uh, that helped me get through college. And I it's got always a nice to have a good Samaritan around. Yes, indeed, indeed. You must have other support systems. Obviously, you don't do your own framing and so on. What kind of support systems or what kinds of things should an artist farm out uh, to someone else, say framing or whatever? Well, I do know that some of the galleries, like, like the, the first gallery that I was telling about in Panama City, he, he owned his own frame shop. He had a gallery and a frame shop. And so he would frame a lot of my work. And then there, there, were, there are one or two galleries now that handle my work. They do the framing. And so... Mm. I tell them what I want for my work. They then add on the framing to it. So I'm not out of pocket in terms of framing. I like galleries who do have that kind of operation because I can pack 10, 15 paintings in a box and ship them all at once. Now there are galleries that do not have frame shops. That's a little bit difficult because you got to, when you get them framed, you, you just, you sit on pins and needles that your work gets there and UPS or FedEx don't hack it up before it gets there. Yeah. So, I do like galleries that have an in-house framing and, and sometimes the galleries owe me so much money, you know, sometimes they struggle, they can't pay. And I said, okay, you know, I need five paintings framed. You can take it off the next check and just send me the balance. And that mm -hmm. helps them and helps the people who are working there as well. And so I have always had a good relationship with the galleries. I can still remember my mother saying to me one time, she said, why are you working so hard? you made enough money. Why are you working so hard? I said, well, mama, you have to understand there are other people's lives that are attached to mine. So it's not always about me. I said, so when I create something because I'm in demand, it helps other families. It's not just about what I can make out of the deal. So, and I've always looked at a gallery as a relationship. There are people there who are on the floor, on the ground floor, talking to the collectors, giving them knowledge about who I am as an artist. That makes a world of difference when you have people on your staff who are educated, who know how to talk to the collectors, because there are people out there who have a lot of money, who don't understand what they're buying. They don't even know how to buy art. They, they know that they're interested. And so a lot of times these people have to also educate them about what they're looking at, why it's a quality work. That all matters when you have a gallery. There are gallery, uh, their galleries, I know the one in New Orleans, they had people there who were art majors, who majored in art history. Those kinds of people who are selling their work makes a world, world of difference versus somebody who don't know anything about art. They might as well be selling a used car because they don't know how to really communicate to the people what they're, what they're looking at and how to, you know, that makes a world of difference in terms of the kind of gallery that handles your work. There are galleries that are very commercial. There's nothing wrong with them. And then there are other galleries that have a little bit more sensibility and they know how, the, how to, to guide the collector if they're interested in really creating a, a real serious art collection. There are people who are novelty buyers who just want something nice and pleasant to hang in their homes. And there's nothing wrong with that either. But what I'm saying is you have to decide what kind of gallery it is and go in and investigate and find out a little bit about their staff. You know, watch how they engage the, the collectors as they walk through the door because that makes a world of difference. So you say, it sounds like you're saying the first step in getting into a gallery is to sort of stroll in the door unidentified, look around, talk to the people and see if they suit your, your needs and your style. Absolutely. You know, and see what kind of work they handle. Uh, and, you know, there's some galleries that have a mixture of, you know, really fine paintings along with commercial things that they know are a little bit more sellable. That's going to help them keep their doors open because most people, as we know, they're, they're insecure about what they're buying and they're, they're, you know, they don't know. And so if uh, paintings a certain amount of money, uh, people, then you, 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 need a, you need a person to be able to communicate why and to be able to exp explain the work. Because uh, some work of mine uh, is, is a little more neutral. There are other works that have a little bit more uh, commentary, modern day commentary. Uh, and so, and there are collectors who are looking for things that are a little bit more challenging to, to the eye and a little bit more conversation pieces. Uh, and those are the kind of things that, that museum curators are interested in and, and very serious astute collectors are interested in. Okay, so the next step then, if you can go back when you no longer had this woman that took you around, mm -hmm. how would you approach a gallery or get a gallery owner to look at your work once you've decided this is a gallery I would like to be in? Well, you can actually find out, you know, from the staff there if there is uh, 
someone they could submit their work to. Uh, but I know, uh, you know, there's different ways you can do that. Uh, I haven't, you know, done that. Uh, I, I, I kind of, you know, I got known as a painter by entering shows like the Florida Watercolor Society and different things. And so my, my gallery situation was different. Uh, galleries approach me, but the 90%, 99% of the galleries approach me, and then I looked, and then I decided. Uh, but there are ways that you can, like I said, in the old days, they used to just send in, a, a, you know, 10 samples of their work. And see, I know with, with, with Brian in New Orleans, uh, there were certain artists that he was interested in, because I remember talking to David, the guy who was the director, and they said, oh, we really like this artist, Brian Beside do you know this artist? And they would call me and ask me if I know. I said, oh, yeah, I know the artist. So they're, they're good. And so then Mr. Allen would sometimes then ask the artist to send a body of the work and maybe 10, 15 paintings. And if the work was not consistent, nine times out of 10, Mr. Allen was not going to take you because he was on Royal Street, you know, and if you're paying 10, $20,000 for a space, uh, you know, that's prime real estate. So if they're putting mm -hmm. you in a gallery, they want to they wanna be able to, to move it, and it has to be consistent. So a lot of galleries want to see consistency. So uh, don't go showing them your still lifes and your landscapes and your painting of the, the bird next door. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it's, it, 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 there has to be a consistent amount of quality because if they do a solo show, what you don't want to do is, is have, a, have, you know, five good paintings and the other 20 are kind of okay. You know, you know what I'm saying? It has to be have to be your own this is why i think jury shows are good too you have to then be your own editor about the body of work that you want to show you know don't show it just because it's done and you need a body of work you rather you rather have 10 really strong works as opposed to 20 works and you only got 10 that's really strong and the other 10 are kind of okay you don't want to go down that road okay you you really got a good start then in exhibitions i've heard you mention this before and yeah. they were kind of your primary source of income for a while. Because I if could, you were giving advice to somebody who wanted to really get started professionally, what would you suggest about exhibitions? You mean the jury shows? The jury shows, yes. Well, so like ours and NWS and whatever. You know, there's there's all kinds of you know you know. Like I said, I've learned a lot about the art world and how it operates. And I do know that there are different art worlds. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the jury, the jury competitions uh, for me was a way of, because I was poor, I had very little money. And the fact that these shows offered prize money, I, was, I, went, I took the gamble and hoping that I would win something to keep myself going because I couldn't hardly sell the work. You know, and so it was out of desperation that I entered shows. I would enter sometimes five, six, seven shows a month. I was just like, like rotating things because it, they were. I was winning, and it was a way that I was able to take care of myself because the collectors just didn't want to spend any money hardly, and so uh, they wanted to get your best paintings for a little bit of nothing. And so they still I, do. I, I I chose to enter shows, and so I would win a thousand or sometimes two thousand. And then I would use that particular award as a marketing tool to sell the work. And then as I was winning, uh, I didn't even realize how much I was winning until magazines came knocking. I was, just, I was just desperate to make a living and didn't realize I was actually building a reputation out of desperation. I was building a reputation as a painter that I was totally unaware of. And so that's, that's what led to more galleries interested in my work. And not only that, after even getting magazine articles, I got a call from a collector from uh, California who wanted to buy a painting of mine, and, and it was like $5,000. He wanted me to send the painting without sending me the money. And I said, I don't know you. I can't send you my artwork. You got to send me the money. So he decided to send me the money, and I sent him the painting. I said, if you don't like the painting, I'll be happy to, to refund your money. Mm -hmm. And he kept the painting, and that collector owns about 97 of my paintings. He's really cornered the market. Uh, he bought a lot of my paintings. Yeah. Uh, it's nice to have a patron like that. Yeah, you said you, you use these winnings as a marketing tool. Yes. How, did, what, how did you, what was the process you did? What did you do? 
Well, I was in Kansas City in my little apartment, and I would read the Sunday paper, and I noticed they had a, they had a little column there, and they would list uh, different things that were going on in the community art-wise. And so I decided to see who was handling that part of the paper, and I said, oh, I'm going to write in and, and, and tell them I won this award in New York, and I won this award in San Diego. And so I took a little list, and I sent it into the paper, and thumbing through the paper one Sunday, I looked, and there I was. They listed my, <laughs> they listed my awards that I won and that I was a resident of Kansas City. So they listed the awards. And the next thing I know, I, 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 uh, a young lady called me up and said, there's a, there's a writer named Steve Penn who uh, I think I can get to, to do an article on you. And I, by then I had entered some local things and I was familiar with, with Carrie Stapleton. She was a, a public relations person there. And so she just took it upon herself to give me the connection to the guy who, who, who was just a general writer for the, for the Kansas City um, uh, Star. And he did, a, he did a nice story on me. Um, and so that led to other things, you know, uh, people even buying a couple of paintings, coming by and buying some things. So, so those awards, I end up using them uh, in the local newspaper, and it, and it actually stimulated uh, some people to become more interested in me. Because yeah. in the beginning, I would go to these, uh, these little uh, parties at, at very wealthy people's places and stuff, and they would show their art collections and stuff like that. And I thought, you know, these people aren't going to help me. Uh, you know, I said, why would they help? Why would they help me? There's a bunch of artists that are trying to get their attention. So I said, perhaps I can use these awards as a way to merit their attention. And by, by using a local newspaper and different things like that to get, to get the word out that I have won. So you're saying an artist should not be shy about writing up things about themselves and sending it out or asking for articles to be written about them? That's right. I mean, number one, uh, you know, uh, like I said, when you pour, you know, and, and there's, you know, you don't have a whole lot of options uh, and you don't have a whole lot of money. You don't have a whole lot of real big connections. And, and, and you know, uh, it, 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 you have to take risks. Now, in, in, in this contemporary art world now that we have, we have young kids coming out of Harvard and Yale and these very high-end Ivy League schools. They step right into the art world, the modern art world, because that world is ran by those particular curators and they select those artists. Uh, they apprentice at certain uh, museums and residency. And so that's a whole different political machine behind their name. They don't have to enter Jewish competitions and shows. I found this out when I was in a show called Black Romantic at the Studio Hall of Museum. Uh, you have people now who are coming out of these Ivy League schools. They're stepping right into the modern art world. They're not entering. They're not, never going to enter Florida watercolor. They don't have to because they got hard tail behind their name. That's all they need. So mm -hmm. it's a different. And I'm just being honest with people. It's a different plane for that. For that, the, the classism that's in this country is not going away, people. It is what it is. And, I, well, and that, that may be the economic one. You're, you're describing the same thing that happens in a lot of top businesses. Absolutely. And so I recognize that being poor, I recognize that. I recognize, you know what, Dan? You don't have anybody. You ain't got no big patron. You ain't coming out of some Ivy League school with, with, with their name on, on attached to your name. You are just a poor kid from the South who loves art, who wants to do it. And you better recognize that you know, you are poor. So you have got to figure out how to make this work for you. And the, the jury shows with the best way. Now, in that particular modern art world, they, they could care less about AWS or NWS or anything other kind of S. They're, they're up there, the Whitney Biennials and all that stuff. That, that's, a whole nother, that's a whole nother group and a whole nother class of artists that they are well insulated because of who they know, who they're connected to, and the schools they went to. And that is the bottom line. It's not going to change. Now, what you can do is get out here and compete. And what I have managed to do is that I've been able to get in uh, the Christian Science Miners, which is a well-read, you know, intellectual paper. I've had a lot of my shows reviewed by critics. All these things matter. Uh, I didn't realize to the degree that they matter, but they matter. And the fact that I've done this so long and I have such a huge track record, if you Google my name, you're going to be reading for a long time. But... When you when you first get out here, if you don't have uh, if you haven't gone to a certain school, it's gonna it's gonna be a tough road unless you already got some serious connections to help you. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you got to figure it out. You just have to figure it out. 
So it may or may not be the same now as it was then. Do you think the role of galleries has changed a lot? I mean, I heard once that something like, oh, a huge percentage of galleries went under in the 2008 uh, recession. That's probably very true. So uh, are galleries still the way to go? Well, you know, I, it depends. You know, like uh, it depends on where the gallery is located. Uh, you know, I recognize the difference between uh, being in a gallery in Kansas City or being in a gallery in, um, you know, uh, like New Orleans. Like I, like I didn't realize that, you know, or Panama City. The difference is, the difference is, Mr. Allen was already a wealthy businessman. The guy mm -hmm. that worked in New Orleans was a wealthy businessman. He had been in business for a long time. And I realized this when I entered the Mississippi Watercolor Society show. I, you know, a lady named Sandra Williams took me over to the gallery, uh, the Bryant Galleries, and every painting was sold. It's, it's, I think this artist's name was Donnie Finney. He was a watercolor artist, too. 18, 20,000, 30,000. Every painting was sold. Number of red dots. And I said, I asked her, I said, well, how, how, how could he sell? I can barely, I can't even get $1,000 for mine. Mine's is twice as big. She said, and you're just. <laughs> and I said, well, he, you know, how is he? She said, she said. This is a valuable lesson. She said, because he's with Brian Galleries. And I was like, well, she said, you don't understand. He's with yeah. Brian Galleries. So that told me right there, the right gallery, the right person record, re you know, representing your work. Because he did come around much later in my career uh, after seeing me in Southwest Art Magazine. He called me two or three times. He won an exclusive. I said, no. He hung up. Called me the following year because I would kept being in his magazine. He said, look. What do you want? I said, a handshake, and that's, and that's it, Mr. Allen. And he said, okay, done deal. So at that particular moment, uh, I was working on my book that he said an art book wouldn't sell. It doesn't help. It doesn't, you know, I have art books. I can't even give them away. So when I did my art book, Brian Allen was doing okay with me in New Orleans, but my sales tripled after my book came out. And you got to understand, this was 23 years ago when a lot of galleries told me it was not the thing to do. It was vanity press. It was this. It was that. I said, well, if you're not willing to do it, you're not willing to take the gamble, and I have the money, and I'm single. Uh, and, and, and guess what? Everybody benefited, including the galleries. And so uh, I learned a, a valuable lesson about the marketing of art, the ability to be able to, for people to pick up a book or mine and read my story and understand where I come from and why I paint what I paint. And suddenly, I became, I became a personality to them outside of outside of just uh, painting the, the people I would, I was able to talk about the people that I were painting. And so people felt more connection with that. And so mm -hmm. I, understood, I understood the power of why somebody like Norman Rockwell became very famous because Rockwell was doing the Saturday Evening Post, one of the most read magazines in, in the world. And so the same thing with, um, I can't remember the, uh, the critic now, uh, but uh, he wrote for time magazine and they asked him, well, why, why are you such an important, or I think the name was Robert Hughes or something like that, who was an art critic. He said, well, why are you one of the most influential, you know, critics of our time? He said, because I write for Time Magazine. So yes. that's the power of the press. It's just like having an article in the New York Times. That's history. Uh, after that article came out with my painting, and it was one of the largest reproductions in the history of the New York Times, guess who called me up? Uh, the Library of Congress. They had to write a biography for me for, on the, for, for the Library of Congress because I had made history. Those are important things that, had I not taken certain risks, would have never happened. Very energetic person there. Can we take one slight, I don't know how to segue this, but um, how would you recommend to an artist that they introduce a new style or a new genre because I see you entering shows and painting topics now. Shows like uh, Masters of the West, uh, The Cordelon. Um, oh, every time I pick up my copy of Southwest Art, it seems there's somewhere you're in it and you're painting things that are not the, the elderly ladies that were so important to you, nor the old houses in New Orleans. Now, I, the one that surprised me, I swear I saw a landscape of the Grand Tetons. 
I can understand all of the old houses on the reservation because that kind of fits in. But you segued there. How do you how do you pull that off? Well, you know what? I if if people see people have people see small parts of me, uh, particularly like for for example, uh, let's let's look at the West. Um, the West think I'm a watercolor artist. They think that's all I do because. For a long time, I just fed them watercolors because I felt like they had a deep underappreciation for watercolor. And I have taken a lot of hits by not being able to sell because they just seem to be reluctant uh, for anything under glass. They're, they're, they're primary, very traditional collectors who only want oil paintings. Yes, and, and big ones. Because they see it in the museum. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and so... You know, I was trying to, you know, throw them a curve with showing them a different medium. But, you know, uh, and the fact that my wife is, is from the West, uh, and I actually got interested in uh, the, the landscape out there after I entered Art for the Parks. And I don't know if people even remember Art for the Parks. Yeah, I remember it. But that's how I got interested in the Tetons, because I'd never been that far West. And when I went when I when I actually went my first trip to, to, to Wyoming to Jackson Hole, I was just so mesmerized by the size of the mountains. I called my mother, I said, Oh my God, you have no idea. this this land is just exquisitely beautiful. It's just unbelievable. So I was captivated by by the landscape. So the fact that I started getting invited to these Western shows, uh, they only wanted things of the West. And so I didn't mind that because I had not explored that landscape and I began to explore the landscape. And so I, you know, I have no, no problem uh, challenging myself to, to do other things. Uh, but I do not, if you, if you look at my, even my landscape, there are my, they're not the more romanticized versions of what they like. My landscape has a heavy abstraction to it. There's a minimalist to it. And I am not a big seller in the West. I will tell you that right now. My work has a different kind of feel to it. It's not, it's not a romantic image, but it is of the West. Uh, and so I'm trying to capture the modern West. I'm not trying to do what Remington did or uh, people like that. There are a lot of artists who are, who are doing that, that kind of flavor of work. And the collectors, they, they love it. But my thing is, you know, I'm in this time, in this moment, and I want my landscape and my work to reflect the time in which I live in. And so, yeah. and that's been a little bit of tougher uh, road to sell uh, out, out, out West. That's been well, it, there, I think you may have some carry. I, I considered you to be somewhat of a tonalist. And then I saw a, you do a painting of Monument Valley, which I'm very familiar with. And it's the first time I've ever seen a brown Monument Valley. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like the same toneless variety instead of the red of the, the, nor, the red of the rocks normally. Yeah, I so mean, you recognize your work. Yeah, there's some of my work, uh, you know, if you look at some of the, uh, there is a tonalist to it, but there's also a, a, a nice interplay of very chromatic color uh, against neutral backgrounds and different things. Mm -hmm. like I'm beginning to do some, you know, there, there's an abstract quality to it where I actually exaggerate the color against the neutrality. And so those are things that as a painter, uh, you, 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 you kind of, you know, you get away from here or there, but there, there are works of mine that are a lot more colorful than other works. Uh, I'm still growing an experiment. I do, I do like tonal type works, but it has a lot of color in it, even though it's, it's very subtle. Mm -hmm. um, the people who like critics and people who review my shows, they can see all the abstracts and the subtle tonal, tonal quality of, of the works. And that's what I think a lot of times when people don't understand uh, art and they look at an artist and they see the success that he has, they don't understand that there's a lot of subtleties in it and there's a lot of nuances in it and there's, there's also some commentary to it as well. Well, I haven't noticed um, some of your acrylics are far more colorful. And I remember reading an article, I don't know what was, where you won a prize in the Autry. Uh, at the Autry for Masters of the West, and it was an acrylic, if I recall, uh, and far more colorful. Yeah, it, I, so. I think as, as a painter, uh, you know, like I said, if people were really to see, there are paintings that I did uh, when I was in New Orleans that were heavily abstract, heavily abstractions with collage and all kinds of stuff in it, 
that I that that the gallery owner told me he couldn't sell. He said, "We'll never sell this. It's got sand in it. It's got all these different textures in it." And somebody bought it. Uh, and so <laughs> I've been able to cross over into collectors who normally wouldn't 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 even touch a watercolor, but they'll they'll buy something that's a little bit more edgy, a little bit more experimental. There was a time when I first started introducing uh, urban urban scenes of of young black men on the streets, and this was in the this was in the nineties. And Mr. Allen said, we can't sell this. We can't sell these black men on the corner. We can't sell this. Send me some more boats. And uh, so I sent the paintings anyway, and a, and a software uh, uh, CEO came in and bought both paintings, and they paid a lot of money for them. I won't say what, how much, but, but the bottom line of it is that's also the thing that, that you'll deal with with dealing with a gallery. Is I remember when the, the galleries were always trying to tell me what the paint, including, Mr., including Brian Allen. But after Mr. Allen sold those two paintings, he didn't bother me anymore about what I painted. He, he but an artist me. might have to put up with that initially. Yeah, you do. And then you have to stand your own ground and send the work anyway. I would send it anyway. He would, well, first of all, he had two gals. He was running the one in, 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 uh, in Jackson, Mississippi. And he would, every now and then he would come to the opening down there when, when, when the day of. But by then, I got all the paintings down there. So it didn't matter. <laughs> So Too late he, to take him off the wall, huh? Well, he come in and he see all the red dots, and he just, you know, saved it. Okay. <laughs> We've saved about 15 minutes here for, or 10 minutes here, for questions. If you've got, we have a couple of them up. Let's see what we want to know. Um, well, some of them we have covered. Like, how has the internet changed your ideas about using a gallery? Hmm. I don't know if they've actually changed my idea about using the gallery because, uh, you know, location, location, you hear that about real estate, location, location. Well, it means a lot when you're, when you're in a gallery, you know, I have a gallery in Jackson Hole. There's one in St. Augustine. That's, a, that's the closest. Uh, there's one in Hilton Head. There's another one in, you know, there's certain, uh, there's one in Palm Desert. There's certain areas where you have to understand, you know, uh, where people go who have a lot of money and disposable income. Well, follow the money. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah. I mean, the gallery, what I, what I recognize is if the, you know, like I got my gallery in Quincy, Florida, but who's coming to Quincy, Florida? I just got to be honest. I love my little town. And I, I want to try to help them and stuff like that. But the bottom line, who's coming to Quincy, Florida? So, but who's going to Jackson Hall? I guarantee you a lot of people. Who's yeah. going to the desert? I guarantee you a lot of people. So, who goes to Aspen, right? That's right. So yeah. you consider where you're putting your work. You can't get upset if you got your work in who knows where and it's not selling. You know, you got you got you got to be smart about where you place your work. But we got to understand too, the competition is going to be stiff in those galleries because mm -hmm. you know nine times out of ten, if they on the if they if they're on the prime drive uh, of any area and they're paying twenty thirty thousand dollars a month. You know, they, they, you have to be established. So that's the other part of it. That's, that's another part of it. So you really need to spend a lot of time on your art, bettering your art from the sounds of things. Yep. Okay. Someone says it sounds like your best advice is to marry the right spouse. <laughs> that's probably true, too. Yeah. yeah well, if, you, if you're going to work, I mean, you know, so, yeah, the, you know, you have to have somebody who's, uh, who's understanding. Uh, because, you know, and I, you know, I've had these conversations with my wife. I say, you know, I, you know, I got to go in on Saturday, you know, because I don't like the, the disconnect. I don't like two-day disconnect with my work. Mm. It's too, there's a feeling of too much isolation when I go in my studio if I'm away from it for two days. I don't like it. Mm. So I don't go in for a full day on Saturday, but I need, to, I need, to, I need that touch. I need to stay in touch. Uh, I need that connection. Because it's easier for me to go in. If I miss one day, it's a lot easier to go in into that isolation and, and produce. You know, if I miss two days, it's going to take me a day or two to get into, to get back into, get, to get back into that. Get isolation. back into the rhythm of it. Absolutely. You, you have a series of prints out. I'm not sure I've seen them until recently. But um, again, back to a support system. How do you get your prints done? Uh, I have a guy here, the Jaclay Prince, I get uh, Eagle Photography does them for me. Uh, and I just, I sell them as the demand comes in. I don't have a bunch of them printed at once. I just print one or two or three quarters of them. 
and, uh, and and these are people who really want something, just can't afford an original. And so uh, they they've actually worked out really really well for us. Uh, so you you don't market them through another source like Fine Art America or something. You just market them yourself. But I just put them on my on my on my website and you know the the gallery in, in St Augustine because they have a frame shop. They frame them up and they sell them too. Uh, so uh, and so it's it's worked out really fine. I I think when you have a reputation that people are hitting hitting your site a lot, people hit my site a lot. And so if they can't afford something uh, and they really like a particular image that's already sold, they say, Oh, I really loved that. So sorry. I don't, you know, and they said, well, can I get a print of it? And they'll go and they'll, they'll look and they'll say, Oh, I see you sell prints of this and they'll buy a print. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a Here's a, I've got one question here that I'm, I'm not familiar with. Maybe you can help lighten this. It says, can you talk about the Rowena series? They'd love to know your relationship with her, and did you paint from photos of her, or pose time painting sessions? Yeah, it, you know, I met Rowena uh, years ago. A, a friend of mine introduced her to me. My grandmother. I was going through a tough time in my life at that time. I, I had just gotten fired from my job. I went through a divorce, and uh, I was extremely depressed. And my then my grandmother died, who raised me in the middle of all this. And a friend of mine uh, attended her church, uh, introduced her to me, and I took a liking to her. I just, I just fell in love with her, and I kept asking her to pose for me. You know, she posed for me, and she, she didn't, didn't want to do it. And then one day she called me and wanted me to – she said, I need to get an air conditioner. And I said, well, Ms. Highball – her last name was Highball. I said, Ms. Highball, I'll, 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 I'll take you and I'll buy your air conditioner if you pose for me. And so she said, oh, I can't let you spend that kind of money. So – Anyway, the bottom line of it is uh, I spent the money, put it up in her house, and she posed for me. I, I did use some, some reference I used, uh, photos, but a lot of times she'd actually sit for me. I did a lot of sketches of her, and I could do a full painting from a sketch. I don't, I don't need a whole lot to do a, a full painting. I can do a full mm -hmm. painting from her, just a drawing. Uh, and when I did use photograph, I, I used black and whites. Uh, I didn't use color. If I do colors, I usually do a drawing, and then I work from the drawing. Uh, because of what I don't want to get caught up in is trying to just copy a photograph. So I do a sketch and then I work from that and then I, I, I take it from there. That's where all the, the colors change and the, the, the tones and all that. It's because a lot of times it's done from a sketch. It wasn't done from, so, so I'm using my own imagination with my own colors. Uh, and so that's where I think uh, you, you create your own feeling. But Rowena was just somebody special to me uh, before she passed. Uh, uh, I did a painting of her. She came over to my home and I lifted her out of my friend's car. And she was very frail. She couldn't walk. And I did a, a painting called Rowena's Last Visit from no, from, from a I, I remember that one. That was done from a sketch and uh, that won the gold medal in the American Watercolor Society. Mm -hmm. um, and she, she passed, you know, after that, too much longer after that. But I did a whole series of her, a lot of drawings. Hey, I would go over to her house and she said she had these great hats. I mean, she had so many hats. I mean, the hats were just, I mean, but anyway, she was just, she was a real joy for me. Uh, just, and she really changed my life because that was the painting of her that was in, a, in the show uh, in New Mexico called the Hubbard Art Wars for Excellence was the one that really thrusted me into the West uh, and got me a lot of recognition in my painting. And I think I was 32 when I got invited to the show, my painting, my two paintings were hanging between Jamie Wyatt's and Henrietta Wyatt Hertz at this particular exhibition. And that really uh, set me off in the West. No kidding. And got me more recognition. I got another show in Denver called Artists of America. And though I didn't sell uh, at that particular show that well, a critic from the Denver Post came in and compared me to some of America's best. And next thing I know, I'm getting a call from the Christian Science Monitor. They do a double page color spread on my work. And the next thing I know, I'm getting a solo show at a new museum at K-State. And here I am meeting one of America's top 100 collectors, Crosby Kemper, who never seen a body of my work. Next thing I know, he's bought, you know, 10, 15 paintings. Must be nice to have that kind of money. Yeah, I know, that's right. I'm glad that could be. <laughs> Somebody does it. We yeah. got, we're almost out of time, but there are two, two observations here. Uh, one is, why don't you just acknowledge you've got to be really good at what you do? Well, I, yeah, I, I, I think that, that, that may be part of it, yes. Um, 
but I do think there's there's a there's a lot of hurdles and obstacles and and I, I think your persistence and just and dedication persistence and dedication yes and getting you would not have been where you are if you hadn't consistently consistently kept in mind where you wanted to be and worked at it. Yeah. And don't, don't be afraid of failure because if somebody says, no, I mean, I've had, you know, I got rejection from shows too and didn't get in and you know, that kind of thing. But you know, people walking by my work, you know, even out West right now, people, I got four grades in free to West. I sell a single one. People walk right by them, you know, uh, but mm-hmm. the bottom line of it is I'll sell them somewhere else. I said, because you know, you can't get discouraged. Other artists are selling, you don't sell, you don't get discouraged. You just say, okay, I'll move them, I'll move them in another market. And nine times out of 10, that's usually what happens. They don't move out west because they're looking for a different sensibility. I move them into another market and I sell them. Yeah. We have one affirmation of something you said. It says, Dean's correct about telling people to send a press release to publications. That's how reporters learn about people or events. I've worked as a reporter and a writer for different publications and venues and tell people that all the time. So you have to publicize yourself. Yep. That is correct. Otherwise, they won't know. How would they not? Well, we've just hit our time mark. Is there one last piece of advice you could give to all the striving artists in FWS? Well, work hard. Keep trying, don't give up, and uh, don't listen to the naysayers because, uh, you know, you know, it's your dream. 